of active TB are tracked down uh, by the health authorities after, after being diagnosed. And um, they ask them questions about who their contacts were. And once they've elicited who their contacts are, um, uh, the health authorities will go and try to find those contacts and test them for infection. Uh, and this is a very laborious process. It's a process where often it's undertaken by uh, short staff, nurse, uh, public nurse, health nurse staff, and um, they are sometimes left with dozens, sometimes hundreds of names in a list that they have to go down. And frequently it involves visits to their houses, trying to reach them on the phone or by mail, uh, but in a very mobile population, all too often it's, they have to go and, and actually seek them out at their homes. This, a similar process is conducted for other uh, diseases of, of great import, most notably STIs and bloodborne infections. Um, so um, it turns out that um, within the context of limited resources, that there's a real premium on being able to use those resources efficiently. And the question here was, um, how can we develop really efficient TB control and prevention programs, and most notably, how can we develop uh, more efficient contact tracing strategies so that we trace down individuals who are at highest risk, um, given not only their own risk of developing TB disease, but the risk of passing it on in a way that takes into account who's associated with who socially and, and in the network. So um, within this model, we're going to be operating on a population which is located within a network, which represents people's contact patterns. And um, each agent within this network is going to be associated with a set of characteristics that include their, um, their TB status, but also their status in, in terms of contact with the healthcare system, whether they're known, whether they're identified as a case, what stage of the process they're in, as well as their age progression. Um, and it turns out that this model is, is richly hitched to a database that records, records these cases and their contacts. The contact tracing protocol uh, within our province uh, involves, uh, for, the, for tuberculosis, involves several stages. In the first stage, someone is brought in for what's known as a skin test. This is also known as a MAN2 test or tuberculin skin test, TST. And basically someone is, is tested um, to see if they've been exposed to TB. Now, if that's positive, they're brought in for review or solicited for review immediately. If it's negative, they let them go back home, but then they seek them out in another few months for a second skin test because their immune system might not have had time to react to the pathogen at first, and it might take time for them to react um, to it, and so they seek them out again and test them again. If it's positive, they go for clinical review, otherwise the investigation is finished. Some of the people may have been known to be positive early on, in which case um, they only bring those people in under certain circumstances. Um, and it turns out that after diagnosis, there's a set of possible pathways they can deliver what's called prophylactic treatment or protective treatment if you've simply been exposed, but you're not an active case. If you're an active case, they treat you. Um, the issue here is multifold, but one of, one of the big issues is there's a loss to follow up. So at each stage of the process, people are lost. And um, uh, it takes a certain amount of time to find people, and uh, people also disappear. Uh, so they may disappear, for example, between the first and the second skin test. Maybe you can't even find them at first. And we had statistics on when people disappeared, how many could be follow up at different, different times. So uh, basically what you end did is she built a model of a community and, and did some studies. And actually, this is an aspect of Asian-based modeling I haven't had time to talk about. Um, uh, sometimes there's a question of how big you want your population the model to be. Um, some, there are cases where we may want to simulate the effects of interventions in a very large population, say a million people, or say 10 million people in LA or something like that. And there's a question, do I need to build my model with a population that large to test those interventions? How if I built it with a population of size 100,000? 
100 point military with a population of size 10,000, would I still get representative results? And it's a non-trivial question. And I've written some of this topic. Um, suffice it to say, there's re there is good reason to believe that you can do it with reduced size populations. But there's a limit to it. So if you went down to from LA with 10 million down to 10 people, you're not going to get very good results. Uh, if you go down to 10,000, you might start getting some pretty good results. In this case, both because the communities are small and because of a set of careful experiments that were done, it was identified that a size of 15,000 or so would be fairly representative. Um, and so what this class project did was to build an interface to allow running of these models and to build the model behind the interface, most importantly. And so this interface allowed you to vary assumptions about the network type. Not surprisingly, these are all networks supported by, by any logic. Um, uh, it allows you to have no contact tracing or to do contact tracing um, and then to, con to prioritize contact tracing along several different lines and then to trace uh, different sets of individuals. It turns out that only, for only some individuals do they ask questions about who you've been in contact with. If someone's uninfected, there's no question asked about who you've been in contact with because you couldn't have infected anyone and you're not, the, you're not yourselves been infected by someone, so why ask? On the other hand, if you have active TB, if you're coughing and spreading, potentially spreading TB, they're going to ask a lot of questions about who you've been in contact with. If you are if you have active TB but you're not infectious yet, that's a borderline issue. Um, right now, they don't ask questions. They just they treat you, but they don't they don't actually ask you who you've been in contact with. Similarly, if you're infected, even if it's recent, unless you're a young kid, they're not going to try to find out who you're in, in contact with because they're not interested in doing what's called reverse contact tracing to find the person who infected you. But we wanted to vary that. We wanted to say, well, what if we did? What if we were to trace even infected people to find out who infected them? Because there might be a hidden person out there that infected them. Or what if we were to trace people who are not infectious, but they're in, they have active TB? What would be the effect of that? And those are the sort of things you can, um, you can vary. Um, and then there are some assumptions about the networks that could be specified. Uh, this model allows you to enable a database, which is used to, um, to write out data and um, allow you to scale down the population if you wanted. And suffice it to say, there are a bunch of experiments done which are highly insightful. Um, our TB control folks were, were um, using the strongest language, good language, to describe this. They were, they were just enthralled by the, what we could look at here because they've been needing to, to work off the seat of their pants to figure out how to prioritize things and how quickly to perform contract tracing. And I want to dive into the model, so I don't want to talk about this much, but the, there were some important things that were noted. One thing was that um, there's a diminishing return. So if you, if you trace the first 45% of, of contacts, there's a lot more of a gain than by tracing the second 45% um, of contacts. Another thing that was noted was that um, the speed of contact tracing doesn't matter much at all. I guess we don't have a, uh, a slide on it here. But the speed of contact tracing doesn't matter much at all um, within the limits we, we looked at. So whether it's three months or within one month, almost no difference. And that has to do with how quickly TB spreads, which is quite slowly, typically. Um, and uh, so current speeds of bringing people in, contrary to what might have been feared, are actually adequate. They have a goal of bringing them all in within a month. They almost never do it. But what this is saying is it probably doesn't hurt you that much. And there's, and there's probably no way to answer this question with system dynamics or... Well, okay. So I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Um, a third question. Okay, so it turns out that, and this adds texture to it, and I'd be glad to share the papers involved. It turns out that we have built a system dynamics model previously to look at this uh, question. And um, uh, we had um, done some similar experiments. The key difference here, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm, I'm just going to show one of one or two slides here, is that um, 
uh, in the system dynamics model, there were things that we had to treat as very rough, uh, uh, in, a, in a very rough way. So specifically, we had a stock of cases, uh, of contacts named by cases from investigation. This was just a count of people. So imagine you're a case, and there's a certain number of people on average with whom you're in contact per month, okay? So they bring you in as a case. Um, and we had statistics that something like each case on average has 30 contacts. Okay? So I'm brought in as a case. And we have a stock and flow model, which is classifying the entire population by how many people are in each state. Same distinction is made in the agent base model. So there's a, uh, uh, there's a uh, set of stocks which are, um, uh, it's it's really this is this is probably a, about as good as um, as it is. It, oh man, um, sorry, wrong key. Um, uh, should have control control F five. I think. Uh, okay, here we go. Um, yeah, this is this is probably the best. This is the system dynamics model which we we tried to capture these phenomena. So same distinctions as as in in terms of health state is in the agent based model, but. Here, we had people going through contact tracing, bringing them from a non-investigated state to an investigated state, okay? So if they were, if they were um, uh, brought in as part of the contact tracing to be tested, they'd go from, from that state to that state. Now, when an individual was, uh, was diagnosed here, they were, had active TB and they were diagnosed, uh, either from infectious or non-infectious TB, they'd be brought in. What would happen is that um, there'd be a set of stocks here. Um, uh, there, there, sorry, there's one stock counting the number of people that are named that are to be investigated, essentially. And when someone goes between these two stocks, it basically adds 30 names to here. Okay, So essentially, you have a separate stock. It's, it's disconnected from this set that keeps track of the number of people to be investigated. And when someone is diagnosed, we add 30 names to this. And then over time, these are traced. Now the key thing though is that in, and, and I hope this will give you a bit of understanding of some of those trade-offs between agent-based and system dynamics modeling. These people that are brought in there, we don't know who they were from here. We don't know who they are based, based on this. There's some of anonymous, homogeneous set of individuals. So when these people are traced by leaving here, completion of investigation, we need to bring them from sort of between stocks here. But we don't know who they are, so we basically assume that the people here are distributed in the same way as the whole population. And so if 5% of the, or say 55% of the population are susceptible, 55% of the contacts are assumed to be susceptible, we'll bring them over. Um, uh, and simply 15% are infected, 15% are brought, brought over here when people are investigated. Now what we can do with this model is something. So we could look at the speed of contact tracing by speeding this process up, how quickly they get investigated by extension, how quickly people who are uninvestigated get transferred to investigated. Okay, fair enough. So we can look at the speed. We can also look at the thoroughness by, instead of having 30 people, we can look at the effect if it was only 20 or only 15 of those 30, et cetera. We can look at thoroughness, and we did that. And what we found was that thoroughness mattered a lot, but there's diminishing returns. So the first, the first, 50% made a lot bigger difference in the later 50%. And speed didn't matter much. Now, what we couldn't do, what we really wanted to do, was to figure out the effects of prioritizing contact tracing. How to make it smarter. How to, how to prioritize this process of tracing people according to the nature of the people in here. But we can't do that because it's all a homogenous set of people here. And so for that, we need to go to the agent based model. Now, interestingly, the agent-based model had the same insights with respect to diminishing returns and speed. 
but it gave us this key ability, key ability to look at the prioritization. And not only that, to look at um, uh, in, more, in more detail uh, some issues of sort of network position and its role in, as a risk factor, et cetera. So it allowed us to look at a, at a finer grain level of detail. But what we found was, was actually very compatible. It was, it's actually uh, quite impressive. So, so let's go back to this. Um, uh, so we found uh, consistent things, but what we, what we really did find is that um, prioritization made a huge difference. And basically it's replacing brawn by brain. It's replacing brute force by some intelligence. And um, to make it, um, to put it succinct, and I don't know if UN had a, um, yes, uh, Yes, okay, right. I think this is, yes, this is the key thing. Okay, so folks, um, uh, it turns out that um, this is no contact tracing at all. So contact tracing is making a difference. That was clear from both the system I name it today to base model. It turns out that um, if you traced 45% of people, but with no prioritization, you get the you get the green here, okay? Now, if you trace 90% of the contacts, this is, this is 90% of some reference level contacts, that will bring it down from the green to this, uh, to this kind of lowest, uh, lowest line here, this kind of gray line, okay? However, if you, if you were to take that 45%, and simply apply, um, simply apply a, a trivial scheme based on age of the contacts, which is one risk factor. Mm -hmm. It brings it down to, to this blue line here. So what that's saying is, essentially with, now there's some variation here at the end we want to investigate, but it's actually very, very similar to that line. So it's saying essentially, um, doing trivial pr prioritization based on something that's obviously doable is, is equivalent to essentially doubling your catch for the number of contacts that you can bring in. So instead of dealing with twice the people and all the headache that involves, um, you can instead just prioritize and get almost the same results. Interestingly though, we had some partners through, base, through something called social network analysis um, had found that there was a strong association between how many contacts a person knew, knows or how many times a given case has been previously named as a contact. That's the way I should put it. There's a strong association between that on the one hand and their risk of being infected or an active TB case. And so based on that, they, they uh, proposed a prioritization scheme that was based on looking at how many times they've previously been named as a case. So in short, if we have a contact on our list who's previously known as a case more times, we prioritize them higher. It turns out that gave adverse effects. Really? Yes. Yes. And it, it, it was totally unexpected, but suffice it to say that I think it's because the association the association is the statistical relationship that could reflect bidirectional causality. Okay, so on the one hand, you could have you could have uh, if if you're a given uh, if if you're a given person and you've been named more times as a as a case before. Okay, um, you uh, pro may be in a high risk environment, and therefore reasonably could be, you know, could be a priority for investigation. So that, that would make sense, right? That those people would be at high risk. But there's another way too. So if you are a person who's been um, named as a contact more times before, it turns out there's, uh, or named in the contact investigation more times before. The other way that could, that could come about actually is that uh, if you were Previously, um, uh, because you're previously a case, 
there is more contact tra tracing done right around you. So it turns out that contact tracing is done because you're a case and more contacts are named in your area of, among your contacts because you are a case. So in short, um, let me see if I can express this well. Uh, the association may reflect, to a certain degree, probably reflects the fact that you're at higher risk um, if you've been named as a contact in the past more. But uh, it also reflects the fact that uh, if you are someone who has active TB, you are, you're the one being traced, typically. You're the one more likely to be traced, and therefore you're more likely to be named as a contact because you're being, your friends are being traced, and they're going to name you as part of that as well. Um, something along those lines. So in other words, um, which was driving which wasn't so, so uh, sure. But in any case, this was a very simple metric to derive through social network analysis uh, through, uh, through, uh, through investigation. And it turns out that it, um, that it performed very poorly for prioritization strategy. We think we could improve it a lot. We think it has the kernel of a good idea. We think that we could refine that metric to separate out the issue of, of sort of collinearity of being named as a contact and being named as a, in your occurrence as a case. Um, separate uh, collinearity because of the contact tracing process itself. But um, it was an interesting thing, prioritization. So if anyone's interested in the paper, I can post it to the manuscript, I can post it to the site. Um, in fact, I can post both these papers. So we have a study about this as a system, an, system dynamics model and then this as an Asian-based model and look at the trade-offs. Yeah, Chris. Uh, so that, that's a good question. Um, th there, there is an upwards trend there. Um, and uh, yeah, um, yes, we believe that this is likely. And it reflects changes in our contact, in our, in our TB control program. Um, uh, so, so you could argue that this is a perverse um, balancing cycle that applies in public health. But um, I think John, John Sturman and Nelson Repenning put it best one time um, when they said, so they have a paper that's it's called something like, nobody ever gets credit for preventing fires that never happen, that have never happened. Um, and, and so in short, when, when we're doing a good job at preventing fires, people get complacent. And they say, well, no one ever sees any fires. Around. Why do we have to have these, these you know, sort of uh, awkward, uh, unsightly air, um, fire, fire extinguishers around? You know, let's, let's get rid of them. Um, uh, why are we putting all this effort into fire prevention if we've never seen a fire? It's the same argument, you know, um, some parents uh, brag about certain types of childhood vaccinations. And it's the same argument you hear with TB. Why put the money in if we don't see too many cases? And so very recently, this has been an issue in Canada, and they stopped, among other things, vaccination for TB. After decades of use, um, they decided that um, they would hold off on vaccinations for TB, and essentially that program has been discontinued. Um, and there's been cutbacks in TB control as well. And we believe that that it's going to be trending upwards because of that. There's a good causal reason. There's also a good reason to to really, really need um, efficiency of the program because the skeletal staffs be deployed and so on. Um, um, I, yeah. Second question is, uh, I'm just wondering how. Yeah, uh, so, so I'm not explaining it well, and, and actually uh, I had a clear idea of it uh, several months back, but I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm messing up the details. It has to do with how the statistic is calculated okay. and, and how contact tracing uh, and who is contact traced. Um, and I think the statistic was calculated in a way that it is fragile 
to, in other words, is not robust to um, this issue of, of how it's traced. And, um, and I don't remember the exact details of it, but um, it, it had something to do with the facts, to the fact that it's only the people who are cases that are traced that lead them to be to be to occur in the tracing data many many times and that was clear st statistically when I looked at it um, that um, and so I I believe it has something to do with that but I'm not I'm not sure that that's the reason what we did find is this adverse outcome that was that was quite unexpected I thought you know at worst it would show up in the wash but, but I was just because I was wondering about like way out there yeah. has never been You've investigated never before. before and, you know, yeah, like I agree that there may be sub secondary effects or well, maybe those are the primary effects. Maybe maybe I'm I'm wrong. I think the 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 ones that I'm talking about I argued are quite easy to deal with in our data. In other words, it's just a matter of, of refining the metric and and using it in a way that it that it's not skewed by this fact that cases drive contact tracing. Uh, I think what you're talking about is a is a deeper mechanism, a theory of the mechanism, and it may be that that turns out to be the dominant one. You know, once we cleanse uh, the cleanse the data, I think there's a lot of work to be done there. What it says though is that uh, despite our hopes, because this is another member of our team, despite our hopes, it's not safe to use that association to directly drive contact tracing. Just because you see an association between these two things doesn't mean that you should. You know, just because uh, being named as a contact many times is highly predictive of your chance of being a case, yeah. doesn't mean that you should rush out and prioritize according to it. Well, I mean, the initial data suggests that you just flip it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. There's something that, there. You should just avoid those people that, together. You that, that's, that's, <laughs> that's right. You know, so. that, that's right. Um, the beauty is that uh, this is not complicated stuff. I mean, this is a sophisticated model, as we'll see as we dive into it right now. But... These strategies, prioritization strategies, are based on obvious attributes that we can elicit more or less immediately, and um, and as such, they're very actionable. You know, um, which is one of the reasons I think uh, our, our TB control program is is so interesting. So I'm going to dive into this um, to this model, and um, I apologize for not. Uh, not having this uh, in front of you right now. Um, so, um, the yes, if you have one. Do you, does anyone have a USB key here? I could, I could do that right away. That would be great. So, um, I'll, I'll dive into it while this is going on. So, this is the largest model you will have seen. Um, it's a model which uh, my student spent, uh, it's basically for her master's prog uh, project, and it involves lots of pieces, but I'm going to try to hit on some of the, the main features of it. If you double click on person, this is perhaps the, the component of it that's most, um, uh, that'd be most sort of immediately uh, uh, recognizable. Oh, thanks. That's great. Um, so, um, here what you see is um, three state charts and uh, uh, there's one state chart associated with uh, TB status, there's one state chart here associated with uh, people's age, and there's another state chart which has to do with this contact tracing process. So if I could uh, go back to, to this, I'll, I'll just sort of show, it's really this process here of, of, of having this sort of staged stage component. So there's a potential contact receive notice, first skin test, second skin test, um, et cetera. Um, now there's uh, a number of additional features here and uh, pardon the, the uh, interruption here. I just want to um, go and copy this. So um, 
I'm going to close this for a second and get this circulating. Okay, so classes, um, right. So example models um, for sharing, um, and then it's uh, student models. Here we go, TB contact tracing. Okay, so. Oops. Okay. Okay. Uh, please, uh, please only use this uh, within this class. This is a, a model that's still under research development, so I'm, I'm trusting everyone here will keep it uh, keep, uh, confidential. Um, uh, so, so going back to this uh, person class, though. Uh, what we have is these three state charts. Uh, we additionally have a set of information on this person um, that includes some basic uh, demographics like their sex um, uh, and their age, initial age group, whether they're uh, a high risk group known as registered Indians within our province, uh, our First Nations people. Uh, and then they have some additional uh, information, um, not all of which is well labeled here but whether they uh, were received a vaccine when they were young, um, which is interesting for, for using that related to risk factors for prioritizing. If we knew people in the contact tracing list were vaccinated, we might prioritize them lower, for example. Um, uh, the current, uh, I believe this is the current state they're in. I think PID is, is sort of their um, person ID. Uh, this is information about their history of of having uh, been delivered T TBI. This is just true or false, whether they've ever received it, uh, whether they have infectious uh, TB, number of times they've been traced, count tracing, uh, whether they're a primary case, whether they're a young case, et cetera. Um, so a uh, person is, is fairly, uh, fairly articulated um, and they, they have some, some basic functions here. Uh, compare to is a function that's going to be used, and this is a new thing for you folks. There's going to be a priority queue here. That's something we couldn't capture in the, in the SD model. Um, so in the SD model, we couldn't really capture prioritization of these people. Here we can, and the way in which we do it is through something called a priority queue. Okay, That's a, that's a queue where Again, I argued uh, before, it's kind of like the lines at the airport. You have um, sub-lines that are, are high, high priority lanes, like for first class customers. You have some, some lanes that are for economy class pa uh, passengers. The longer you've been waiting as an economy class passenger means you're further in the line compared to other economy class passengers, but people from the first class line can bypass you. And so it is with a priority queue. So there's this notion of compare to in the priority queue. And, um, and basically that takes into account um, uh, the uh, sort of the, the priority classes of an individual. And that class depends uh, whether they, um, uh, according to sort of how things are being uh, prioritized. This isn't all done as, as I would have done it, but it provides one implementation that Yuan found worked. Um, uh, okay, so, so this is uh, for a, a person class. We'll see where the priority queue comes in here in just a minute. Um, so if we go up to main, um, what we'll find <coughs> is some features that are familiar, like the population here, and then some features that are, are unfamiliar. Um, so there's this, this a thing called cube here, um, and uh, there's a uh, uh, there should be a the priority um, priority queue here as well. I'm gonna have to have to um, look for it, but um, uh, there's a priority queue by which people uh, progress. Now one of the things that UN um, UN did is she actually provided visually some indications. This is sort of a la Vensim, um, what things depend on what other things. So for example, these variables here are calculated from one another. And so she's actually drawn lines between them to illustrate the fact that you know, one depends on the other. So you could kind of see, get a sense of those dependencies. Um, 
uh, there's various things related to the settings uh, settings as well here. Um, okay, so um, uh, I should note that there's there's also some database classes here. Um, classes which insert things into the database or query things from the database, and so we'll see where those are used. Um, but this, this system basically outputs a lot of data on what's going on contact tracing wise to the database. Okay, so, um, oh, you know what? I forgot to include the jar file. Well, you can get it online. I could also provide it. Uh, it may be on the website right now. In any case, uh, is there? Okay, great. Great. Um, so it's in the it's in the folder. Okay, great. Um, uh, I uh, you're not going to be able to um, run the uh, database uh, directly um, uh, because it doesn't exist on your system. But um, uh, you can see the database uh, classes there. Okay. So uh, right now, if you were to run this this model, um, I think it's under, for example. Uh, contact tracing here um, uh, it should be able to excuse me um, okay so there's a huh that, that's weird uh, uh, I'm not sure huh did I okay maybe I just deleted something by accident there we go um, build okay uh, there we go so that's cleared up um, there's a missing end uh, curly bracket at the end of my my DB so I'm not going to enable the database here, but um, if you run this, basically what you'll see down in the console is uh, some um, some printouts, and I think it is going to um, uh, okay, right? Um, it's going to be running uh, running along here. Um, trying to look what uh, huh? Uh, uh, here we are. Yep. Okay. So here's here's individuals being investigated. It reports the queue size at the time that they're being investigated, etc. We're going to go see how this actually works. Uh, sorry. Oh, okay. It was at uh, end of my SQL DB. I, I probably just you know, pressed space and got rid of this or whatever. It was just you need a you need a, a curly bracket there. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so let's go. Let's go check out person and let's see how some of these things work. Um, you had has been working on this um, underneath me, and I'm not. Uh, some of this is actually uh, fam unfamiliar for me to look at. I know I gave her advice on how to do it. Um, her coding style is, is a bit different than mine, but uh, uh, we'll bear with that. Um, and actually, she's done an admirable, uh, admirable job by all counts. It's just that uh, you can you can tell that we have uh, somewhat different ways of doing things. Okay, so let's look at one of these things where a person goes from an infectious, undiagnosed, to one who's diagnosed and under treatment. So if we go to, for example, non-infectious to active TB under under treatment, um, if we look at that, uh, you'll see a number of things here in the um, in the um, action areas and uh, some of these have to do with um, things she's she's done which are quite innovative I think and, and merit some discussion some have to do with sort of deeper principles of the model so one thing you'll see for example is this cube a reference to cube do you see that um, get main cube um, so anyone want to comment on um, what they think this is doing? We've actually seen something similar before, but this is a generalization of it. What do you think this cube does? Oops, sorry. Should go back to that. If, if, if you have cube... Um, so what this is doing is it, the cube is an array, and it's looking up the thing for age group such and such, whether or not persons are registered in, and based by state. And it's incrementing one state and decrementing another. So it's actually keeping track of how many people are in each state of each different type. And in fact, if you go to Maine and you go look at variables, so you look at cube here, um, what you'll find is that something of 17, this is 17 age categories, I believe, 
two ethnicities in 11 possible states, health states, um, active TB states. So this is a, uh, a multi-dimensional double array. So you can have arrays. I, when I've introduced arrays, they've been single dimension um, here. But you can have arrays that are not only single dimension like this, but are two dimensions. So with a two dimensional array, each element to so each row as it is is an array. Or you can even have them be three dimensional, in which case it would go back kind of into the board, kind of like this. Um, and you can again have many, many sort of um, columns going back into the board. Um, so uh, this is an array, it's a three dimensional array, and it's doing bookkeeping. It's keeping track of sort of well, how many, let's keep track of the stocks. How many are in each different stock? Um, conceptually, those numbers are quite similar to what's in the system dynamics model. The dynamics will be much more textured because you're going to have things like priority queues that are going to drive people from one to the other. Okay, but, but that's one piece of what's going on there. Um, and you'll notice how she did that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's a good question. So, if those are, uh, yeah. So, there's a cursive dimensionality. So, it, it it becomes larger and larger very quickly as the number of things goes up. Three, um, uh, in the grand scheme of things, um, for that particular cube, um, that's pretty small potatoes um, because you know I think each. Um, I, I can't remember what it is these days, but uh, if you do 17 times 2 times 11, and each each double, I think, is 4 bytes. So this is like 1,400 bytes. Uh, so that's actually, well, there's actually some additional over it for some references, but it's it's pretty pretty contained, pretty contained. But if you start to go to 4 dimensions, 5 dimensions, 6 dimensions, it would blow up in this geometric way. Uh, good good question. Um, but this is a way of simultaneously keeping track of things across there. And you'll notice what Yuan did. It's quite clever. She had a new state. She maintains a thing called state. And she declares what this new state is. She has sort of named each of these states in state 7, state 6, etc. And she kind of uses those to, to do the bookkeeping, take people out of the old one, put them in the new one, and then assigns the new state to be the current state. Okay. Um, she also keeps track of kind of, okay, what's the diagnosis method, et cetera. Um, but then she also does further things. Like she has this add case thing. So, okay, someone's becoming a case. When we say case here, we mean that they're a, they actually have the disease, okay? So, uh, and that it's known. They're, they're known to the healthcare system. So this add case call, um, anyone want to guess what that does? We do add case. We're calling off to get main add case. Ooh, I thought it was a get main. I'm pretty sure it was a get main, right? Add add case. Um, what do you think the function of that might be? Well, it turns out that um, uh, that add case um, is very useful as a method because it inserts data to the database. So here's actually, this is probably the first time you've, you've seen it, and uh, please excuse the effrontery, but um, this is actually putting together a, what's called an SQL state, standard query language, uh, structure, standard query language, and, and basically this inserts into the database, into some database, and there's lots of databases that support this standard separation of interface from implementation. Lots and lots of interfaces support this standard. Um, here we're inserting the simulation ID, the, uh, the case number of this person, the diagnosed time, whether a vaccine was delivered to this person, their TB status, um, TB status ID, past TB records, etc. We're inserting all this information into there. Okay. Um, so uh, that's a bit of reporting. And you'll notice that that's only done if the da database is enabled. So she kindly allowed me to disable the database so Prof can run it too. Um, 
she, so she, she doesn't have to run in her machine. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, arguably the next thing is the most important, is one of the most important junctures in the whole, the whole model. And you remember that when, I, when we were talking about this other model, I argued that there was this key juncture um, uh, where, where when people went, were diagnosed, that would basically add people into here, right? It would add people into this list to be named. Well, that's really what's going on here, this contact tracing action, okay? So contact tracing action is a method. It's one of the couple of methods in person. And this method is uh, longer than 10 lines. Um, it, uh, it involves a couple of steps, but the, um, uh, the actual steps are, um, are something along the lines of the following. Um, if this person is to be traced, um, uh, then uh, what it's going to do here, and I'm, I'm reading her code and trying to guess. It, it could be, uh, commenting could be improved. Um, uh, so basically what's going to happen is that you are going to get a list of Q, a list of people to be traced. And then for each of your contacts, it's going to go, go through and um, it's going to figure out by chance if this, this person is going to be traced based on the fraction of contrasts that are, are, are traced. And uh, if they're to be traced, it's going to queue them up, okay? It's going to put them in the queue. Now, when we put them in the queue, that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be at the end of the queue because they may be a higher priority person, in which case they'll kind of pop forward in this, in this queue accordingly. Um, and then, after getting that, it's going to go through this queue in order of the priority, pull people out, and it's going to sort of be recording the number of times that they, that person has been traced. And then um, uh, here we're going to do some, um, uh, right, we're going to see if the case is a, a new or existing case. If it's previously positive, then we don't, we're not going to do anything with them. Otherwise, um, uh, we're going to deliver them a letter for contact tracing. Okay, so we're going through this queue in the order, and we're sending off these letters to people. So we're assuming that gets done uh, quickly, and um, and similarly for for primary cases, we're going to handle them somewhat differently. For for young kids, there's a, a different set of rules. So in short. We're going to be getting, when, when we go down this transition, in addition to all the bookkeeping and so on, in addition to recording data, we're going to be taking all these, this person's, if, if this person is worthy of contact tracing, and that depends on the scope of contact tracing as selected by the interface, that, that we're going to be going down, getting their contacts, and for a subset of those contacts, uh, we're going to be um, putting them through for contact tracing um, and, and uh, by, by sending them a letter, okay? Sending them a letter to bring them in. Now, when those people are sent a letter, what do you think that affects, given that what we've seen? So we've, we've gone through, we've sort of gone through these contacts of the case, of appropriate cases, and sent them a letter. What should when they get that letter, when contacts get a letter, where, what would that affect here? Well, it affects, it affects this. Um, yeah, so when they get a letter for contact tracing, um, uh, so when they get this letter, they will go to this state here. And uh, in this state, they will then be waiting um, some period of time based on, on sort of historic rates before they go into this first sort of skin test thing. So essentially sending those notices to the contacts allows them to proceed here and then um, they can go on to each of these uh, components. Now uh, subsequently um, 
Uh, there's some people who are lost to follow up. Um, so there's a condition if they're if they're lost to follow up. Uh, and um, and then there's uh, there's a certain rate at which people go from the first skin test to the second skin test. Um, uh, so uh, a certain number of of months. Um, so uh, this is this is a rate here, and then. Um, uh, under certain conditions, they'll sort of uh, go back. Um, well, th they're going to they're going to be treated here, or they're going to uh, go through this uh, skin testing. Now, now for this, um, uh, once they go in for this uh, second skin test, uh, they're going to uh, potentially be diagnosed. Uh, now, up here. They were potentially diagnosed after this uh, first skin test. They could also be diagnosed at this stage here. And um, once they go into this uh, state here, they're now in a previous positive state, but um, they may uh, additionally, uh, there's some additional, um, additional logic associated with that. So uh, I believe some of these individuals are now, uh, are now treated Falling being identified, so there's this, there's this um, playoff between the this component and and this tracing component that yields uh, people to be traced down, uh, treated prophylactically, etc. And you could see some people are sent TLTBI notices, for example, which is uh, prophylactic treatment. Um, in other in other cases, they're sent uh, contact tracing, contact tracing uh, notices. There's, in addition to this, there's some logic associated with aging. So individuals age between age groups. And um, this is, she keeps track of these five-year age groups here. Um, so there's a timeout, and it goes on. And then there's a thing called update age group. And I believe update age group takes into account the, um, we're, we're going to look at it here update age group takes into account all the bookkeeping that's required when they switch between age groups. So she's keeping track essentially of the stocks um, as people go between age groups so she can output statistics. And uh, periodically this model uh, is going to be uh, writing out, um, so I'm going to be looking at these events here. Um, Right, the events here. Um, uh, insert records here. Um, so uh, periodically, uh, insert records uh, is going to uh, insert into the database uh, information on the number of people in each stock. So it's it's inserting that information to the database so that she can retrieve it later uh, from the database. And this is done with a certain frequency, I believe, of, uh, yeah, cyclically. It's done every one time step. So it's, it's going and writing these things uh, to the database. Um, so that's, um, those are some major components of the model. She has, uh, some historic data enco encoded in historic time series using these table functions, kind of uh, like what we've seen. This is based on historic data that we have from, um, from Saskatchewan uh, TB control on the number of individuals, for example, who have uh, undergone TLTBI, or excuse me, undergone um, uh, vaccination or TLTBI or, uh, or births that have taken place, et cetera. Um, so that's most, oh, oh no, there's one, um, right. So there's one other thing, uh, that is of, of relevance, um, relevance here. And that is, um, when a person, um, comes to the, uh, okay, let's go see it. I guess we maybe did look at it, but um, so when a person gets through the uh, contract tracing steps here,
there's this um, uh, there's this pre previous positive state that they get in, and what's there in a previous positive state? Essentially, they're not um, subject to most contact tracing uh, any further. The um, it's really when they're uh, entering this state that they um, that they may be subject to uh, to further uh, uh, further treatment, such as via uh, TLTBI. Um, and um, right, um, and then this person can be successively uh, traced. It appears. Um, uh, excuse me. No, this is just recording the sort of number of positive contacts. Okay, so this model, in short, is keeping track of a lot of data as it's running. People are being traced. There's this. Uh, there's this priority queue, and really the uh, prioritization. Um, as accomplished the priority queue is is essentially um, established by this uh, compare to function and uh, compare to works in conjunction with this priority get priority function so essentially get priority um, uh, it looks at what prioritization scheme is underway and based on that it computes uh, it computes the appropriate um, uh, appropriate quantities based on relative risks involved of, of different factors. So, if priority is based based on counts, it takes into account the number of reported uh, reported counts. If prioritization is by age, it takes into account the sort of relative risk of infection by age for each age group. If by, if it's by ethnicity takes into account the contact coefficient by ethnicity. So that's uh, that's how that um, how that scheme works uh, for for get priority, and that's called by compare to. And the way the way this uh, has an effect is that in that prioritization queue, which we looked at before, uh, so associated with with this, we had this contact tracing action. And contact tracing action created this priority queue, um, and um, uh, this uh, this priority queue, which is only of the the length of the person um, here, that knows to call compare to in order to rank people. So, in other words, the people within that their compare to method needs to be provided in order to use, um, so that gets called automatically by the priority queue. The priority queue knows to use, uh, to use that information. So if we look here, um, this used to be a contact tracing action. If we take a look at uh, priority queue. Priority queue takes this argument here um, this is a, a type argument. It says what what the sort of contents of the priority queue are. Are they people? Are they trucks or whatever? And this has to be something that provides this uh, compare to interface. So uh, if you look person here, you'll notice it's comparable. So person implements the comparable interface, and what that means is that it provides, in concrete terms, a compare to method that takes in another person and returns an integer. And so the priority queue that's used in contact tracing action here um, uh, is something that, so this priority queue makes use of contact tracing action when ordering people within it. So basically, it's calling their compared tos and saying, "How do you compare to this person? How do you compare to that person? How do you compare to that person?" And it's arranging them in an order accordingly. Okay. Okay. So uh, I've just presented some of the core components of this model, which, as I say, is a very uh, a very large model. Um, any questions I could answer about this model right now? For some of them, yeah. 
so so there were, there were two um, two broad sources of parameter estimates. Um, one were these sort of parameter estimates. Um, uh, so um, it's actually uh, so some of these were more for calibration, but some are, are for parameters. So it's sort of what what fraction, for example, are lost to follow up, um, or how long does it take to go from um, to identifying a contact to to following it. So like 16% are within 30 days. They aspire to 95% within 30 days. It's actually only 16%, but again, our model suggests that it doesn't really matter that much. Um, uh, so these these were from from them provided by them. There were an additional set of of, of estimates that we actually drew from. Um, and this is subject to, to you know, some reasonable criticism, I think. But we actually drew them. We have a highly, highly calibrated system dynamics model for the province, which is calibrated dozens of time series using similar model structure in terms of um, individuals. It's actually not this model, but it's a, it's a, it's a separate model. And we had some parameter estimates from that, from that process. So we used. Uh, against dozens of empirical trends, it matches them simultaneously, and and it's um, a sort of thing where we've noted some discrepancies, but um, uh, for example, some of those discrepancies have been recognized as problems with the data, uh, not problems with the model. Uh, in discussion with our TV control, so that's a model that we're pretty confident captures the general character of the. Um, of the TB context, and we took some of the estimates from there and introduced them into this model. This is not our final model. I mean, we, this is really a, a master's thesis type model, and we're hoping to turn it into a, uh, a sort of rigorous and robust model for a PhD thesis. And UN may go on and do that, um, or maybe someone else. But, but um, you know, we're, we we think those those numbers. Um, let, let's put it this way. If, if I were to critique this paper as a reviewer, I would say I, I'm skeptical as to whether those calibrated values from a system dynamics model will carry over directly to the agent-based model. You know, if you were to calibrate the agent-based model against all those historical trends, uh, I'd be a lot more confident about those values. Um, and, and they probably would be somewhat different. On the other hand, they, my, my judgment from working with a lot of models before is they're probably not wildly different, but that remains to be seen. You know. um, so, um, you know, uh, uh, that's, I think, uh, somewhat of a weakness of, of, of the strategy, but it is something that we did for, uh, for pragmatic reasons, and we don't think it takes away from the, the general power of the idea of doing this. But yeah, other questions? So um, actually, some of the data data are in here. I don't know that all of it is, but some of it are. Um, and really, this goes back to discussions we've had in our um, uh, in our um, calibration lecture. But uh, for example, here. Um, so if you go up and you look in Maine, uh, UN has has quite a few time series. Um, uh, so, for example, this uh, BCG rate with aging non-RI would be one of them. Um, uh, and here's BCG rate with aging uh, RI. Uh, but we additional had for, uh, additionally had, for example, um, uh, historical, um, I think this was an estimate of sort of uh, time to, and that wouldn't be time to contract tracing. I'd have to look what she meant by that. But uh, uh, default rate. This is default from treatment. Um, I believe uh, this is um, uh, right. This is uh, death rates from TB, uh, uh, and this is uh, for, for different uh, different subpopulations. Um, this is uh, uh, 
uh, okay, so these are for different um, subcategories. Uh, we had, uh, okay, sorry, those are, those are general death rates. Here are TB death rates. Uh, uh, TLTBI administered was another one. Um, uh, and this is latent TB infection rate. These are some of them. We actually had much more extensive ones for the aggregate model that aren't, aren't in here. Um, we have a separate paper on that I could send you. But um, broadly speaking, we had a uh, number of relapse cases uh, broken down by age, by ethnicity. We had a number of, of uh, people in different age categories uh, who are found to be infected with TB, for, particularly for children, to some degree for elderly age categories, again, broken down by ethnicity, I believe. We had number of new cases of active TB um, for by age and ethnicity, we had a uh, number of infraction of those that were infectious by, uh, I, I don't think those are by age and ethnicity, I think that was an aggregate estimate. We had a number of cases of treatment uh, offered um, and uh, so new individuals and relapsed individuals and um, number of uh, TLTBI administered, BCG vaccinations delivered. Um, those are most of them, but then there were some like um, uh, number of contacts per case um, and, and various factors like that. Most of these were time series on a per year basis. And we basically required the model to, um, to match those time series in calibration. And, uh, and assess the kind of the goodness of the match across, across many time series. Uh, so that was sort of the process we followed for, for calibration. And I could, again, I could send you the other, the other paper, which is about our aggregate model that talks some about that, uh, that process if you were interested. Yeah, yeah. Probably, it's, it's Osgood and, and Mahmoud and, and, and Hefner and, Alizam and I think Tian. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so those are those are good uh, questions. The what one issue we had with that calibration, I'll just note, is that we uh, weighted the data um, according to, uh, to, to to using some weight criteria, and I think. One thing that I tried to take into account is the um, the quality of the uh, the statistical reliability of the data, because smaller like if you looked at number of incident cases for the whole population, right of of TB, um, you're dealing with a much larger denominator, and so statistically speaking, it's less uh, variable in terms of proportional variability than if you had, you know, for a given age group, right, and so. Um, that's something which you, you can address by weighting in a uh, calibration of an aggregate model for, a, um, for an individual-based model, an agent-based model like this. A lot of that variability would come out of the, in the calibration process as well. Um, and uh, I don't think the weighting process will be quite as sensitive to that because um, uh, I, I think the fact that the, very, the model is stochastic w m might allow, uh, allow you to sort of fold in some of those uncertainties just into the calibration process itself. But I'd have to think about that further. Yeah. It makes it world of sense, not least because we do have some data for TB where that's actually pretty similar to what's done. So, so for example, we have, um, we have data early on on community-wide screening, but it was only certain communities that they would pick. Uh, uh, in other cases, what we have is uh, school screening for, and I believe it's sort of subsets of schools and so on. So that's actually a really interesting idea. And yes, you could do that. Um, uh, you'd, 
you know, you might really want to think about if you're capturing the appropriate biases in this in the selection process of sites. <laughs> yeah, but 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 it's it, it's an intriguing thing that you have that flexibility, yeah. right, to yeah. do that, to, to to undertake that. So, um, that would be something that would really be um, be worth thinking about, actually, because there might be some cases who would be really worthwhile. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, the paper is 3,500 words is a tight limit, and we had to cut a lot. Uh, it's painful. Um, so, I, I think for certain of them, it's, it's quite, uh, quite straightforward. I mean, um, uh, if, you have a, if you have contact tracing going on, and um, you are uh, not prioritizing, um, one, or, one of two things are going to happen, or both. Either you're going to take longer to find the people, uh, you know, some people, or you're going to, um, so in other words, uh, there's going to be some people take a long time to get, some people have a short time to get. And uh, if, you're, if you're not prioritized, it'd be sort of uh, haphazard as to which is which. Um, and second of all, you may, l some of those people that would have taken a long time, you may lose to contact tracing, lose to follow up. Um, if you are prioritizing your contact tracing, you are going to be bringing in preferentially early and therefore with lower range of loss to follow up individuals who are higher priority, you judge as higher priority. We know through studies, uh, diverse studies that, that there are certain risk factors for TB. Um, so kids get, um, you know, they, they need less, by the way, of an infecting dose. And so if they breathe a given amount of air with the TB microbacterium, they're more likely to get infected. And um, they're more likely to progress to a given infection to active TB case. So um, it's not too surprising that if you prioritize by a couple clear criteria that are known risk factors that you can, you can, um, shorten the time to those people are brought in and thereby either stop them from spreading the infection if they were infected or or more quickly find out who who infected them and both of those things are valid reasons so even if the risk factors aren't causal drivers for tb um uh, TB infection, if they're merely markers of risk, uh, sometimes bringing those people in earlier could, uh, could allow you, I mean, it's kind of like bringing in uh, someone who's, um, uh, who, who could more quickly point you to a hub of infection. You know, you could more quickly get to, get to a driver for, for the infection by bringing those people in. Um, so, and, and you know, uh, you may keep some people waiting, but the people you keep waiting will often be at lower risk. So therefore, they're not as likely to need the treatment for latent TB infection soon. Um, and they're less likely to be uh, infectious than spreading it. You know, so they're, they're less at risk of adverse outcomes on their own or of spreading it. So that's, you know, in a nutshell, that's kind of my guess as to what's going on, uh, waiting causes spread and waiting causes adverse uh, evolution of people's symptoms. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, especially because in the model, people, they get TB, and this is reflective of the way it is in the world. You get active TB, you go from a latent state to an active state, but typically you're not infectious immediately. And a lot of the recent contact tracing works so well in, in Canada and other developed countries, contact tracing for TB is because it gets people before they develop infectiousness. And um, 
and that allows a world of difference because you know they may have been suffering symptoms to some degree but they're not spreading it yet and if if you can bring them in quick enough that they're not spreading it um, then that really could reduce the, the burden of spread and I think that's what prioritization does more effectively it allows us to do that um, now why prioritization with respect to this other risk factor that was identified this one based on number of previous contacts didn't do that effectively I think is an intriguing question and it's what we didn't have time to, to really look at in this paper but which we want to look at um, it was uh, is one of those surprises that you know um, uh, sets you back but it's an opportunity to learn yeah yeah, yeah sure other questions? That's, that's true, although, um, th I mean, there is the concern also that they themselves may, may be progressing adversely. But a lot of it, the real... I mean, the, from the public health standpoint. Yeah, that, that's I mean, right. Exactly. That, that's right. In terms of sort of snowball effect, yeah. that's the thing that really matters. Yeah, um, I mean, what you really want here, though, is not only that, you want actionable things. Something that you can know before you completely traverse the network right before you go across the entire network and find everyone you'd want to know just given that name and the little bit that's known about that person something actionable and I mean what we found in, in the papers David notes is, is um, found age you know, just knowing are they a kid or not is surprisingly powerful that, that actually was of all the things powerful if you combine that interestingly the way these things sort out with this prioritization, if you start combining age with something else that's reasonably predictive, like if I combine, if I have age, and I know that's, that's very powerful, and I further have something like uh, ethnicity, and I know that that's reasonably powerful for, for uh, prioritizing people, you might think by putting them together you can do even better. No, because you may be shortchanging some people who are at high risk because of age just because they're of the you know, lower priority ethnicity and so on. It's really age that's the important thing. And we get a much stronger signal for age than from anything else. Um, uh, that is something you could ask. You know, so, so this Joe Doe that you know, <laughs> it came out well. Um, so, so this Joe Doe, uh, um, is, 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 you know, are, they, are they a kid or not? You know, oh yeah, you know, are they so and so's kid or what have you? That can help you actually from the get go sort of prioritize. Okay, we, we got to follow up to them really quickly. Um, asking about um, network position, for example, like I suspect network position, their position in the network may be key. Are they a hub, for example? That's it's, it's not quite as easy to find out during contact tracing, is that the case? I mean, you could ask things that are suggestive like, you know, is this a really, is this a social butterfly type of a person? Is this someone who, who's known to, to know lots of other people? You might be able to use things like, have many other people named them already in this episode of contact tracing or something like that. But it's harder to kind of, to, to, to get your mind to, to get information ahead of time on that factor post hoc you might be able to yeah are you, guys, are, are you allowed to use publicly available information so if for example I know that this person came in are you allowed to let's say go to their Facebook page yeah and you sense that I mean if that's yeah. publicly available okay that's really interesting that is interesting right? and then you go there and so you have <laughs> yeah. I mean, is, there, is that legal or is that something that's just 
Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, um, I mean, actually, by the terms of the Public Health Act, this is not acted on. Uh, in fact, our contact tracing process, it's, it's a very interesting comment on the feedbacks of both. Our contact tracing process is extremely uh, cautious about this. Uh, by the terms of the Public Health Act, you could bring someone in and confine them because they could spread the infection. I mean, it's that serious. Uh, with something like TB, I mean, TB is a disease where if it's left untreated, uh, approximately a third of the people die. And uh, there are cases of people who die from it now, babies who go undiagnosed, people whose doctor thinks it's just a cough that they have. They keep on giving them antibiotics. Um, and it doesn't work out. So it's rare these days that people die, but it sometimes happens. Uh, so it's a deadly infection. Now, the disadvantage, I mean, so in, in principle, if someone's playing fast and loose with you, you could actually call the police in and have them incarcerated. But that's, that's really not done by at least our, our provincial health authorities because they realize it will backfire. People will start hiding more effectively. They will, it, it, they'll get a bad rap, you know, that, oh, these people are about confining you. And really all they want to do is talk to you, do some simple tests, and get you help. And, and a lot of the people who get TB in our province are people at real risk. They're people who are part of marginalized populations, homeless people, people who live very, um, you know, who don't, who don't uh, perhaps have a settled home, people who sometimes have substance abuse problems, um, sometimes it's uh, prostitutes, and these are people who are not interested in close contact with the law, generally. And so the, the more the contact tracing process becomes identified with legal enforcement, the more you alienate these people and the more they disappear into the woodwork. And so they basically almost never use, I, I've never heard of a case in recent decades where they've used that power. But look at Facebook page, new problem, I think. And it's an intriguing idea. The, the issue though is that a lot of these people are transient. They're very, they're lucky if they have a cell phone, much less a Facebook page, right? And, um, you know, they're probably not going to be on there a lot, uh, documenting all the relationships and so on. So uh, you could use other types of information. I mean, conceivably, you could use cell tower records to give a sense of where they're located or how many people they've been. Are they in high, high transmission areas or what have you? You might be able to use uh, call records from the cell phones to know are they in contact with lots and lots of other people and who and give that, give you a leg up on knowing who, who else they might be connected with, something like that. But you're, so in, in that sense, I think your question is really intriguing one. Um, but um, uh, a lot of it has to do with how quickly can we mobilize this information, you know, um, to, to address it. Okay, um, so, so that, was, uh, that was one model. I'm going to try to put that model on the website additionally. Um, and uh, see if we can get um, some additional items up on the on the website.